this is a, um, a cultural presentation on uh, perspective of the world through the internet. Uh, my name's Shiloh, my Chinese name is Li Mei. I'll be going first. So a lot of us probably use Amazon decently often. I try not to, but you know, Shopaholics is a real thing. Um, so what I'm gonna introduce to you guys is what's called Taobao, which is kind of like Amazon, but in China. So it's one of the most popular uh, shopping apps in China. Um, has many things that you can purchase from like toiletry items to organizational items and pretty much anything that you can think of Taobao has it just like Amazon does. Um, I, I have to verify but I'm pretty sure that COVID also helped boost the popularity of Taobao just like it did for Amazon. Um, let's see. So next I'm gonna show you guys a video, um, basically just explaining the basics of what it is. So yeah, basically Taobao is kind of like Amazon and TikTok put together because Amazon you get all the shopping that you want and then TikTok tells you what you need to buy and the things that you need to have if you want to like you want to be considered fashionable or not old. <laughs> oh. Hold on. And so these are some of the popular items um, as of within the last nine months or so that people have bought on Taobao. So the, Top picture is the lucky fortune tree decorations where people are putting them literally in any possible place that they can find. Um, neck massage mats, children's toys, anything from beading to like paint by numbers, crafting stuff, um, baby bottle sterilizer, that one caught me off guard, but baby supplies, anything like that, bathroom necessities, pretty much if you can think it, you can probably buy it and find it on Taobao. <coughs> So I'm Michael, and my Chinese name is Meng Zhuigo. And uh, traditional Chinese is one of the world's oldest medical systems. It, it's, it is based off the Chinese philosophy of the connection between humans and nature. Its theories refer to internal organs, qi and blood, yin and yang, the, fire, the five elements, channels and collaterals, which is shown in the picture in the bottom right, and with that statue or whatever. Um, body fluid, the differentiation of symptom complex, complexes, which is just basically a fancy word for um, diagnosis, diagnosing someone, uh, methods of diagnosis, and so on. Uh, it uses methods to help the body heal itself naturally compared to like Western medicine, where you get like a pill or something. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the main features uh, are a holistic point of view and treatment according to a differentiation of syndromes, syndromes, 
which is like diagnosis of Cleveland. And um, so on the internet, there are many fake and inferior med medicinal materials sold. So it's it's pretty difficult for people who aren't are not a professional to identify real and quality medicinal materials and worsens the reputation of the Chinese medicine industry. So this is an example of a listing of uh, a traditional Chinese like medicine material. And this is rhizomes of Chinese gold thread and it's on uh, ZYCCST.com, which is the first letters of each Chinese character, or uh, but, but it also means uh, something like honest traditional Chinese medicine <coughs> materials expert. So um, after Western medicine was introduced in China, there were many ideas about the future of traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, they included only using Western medicine, uh, keeping traditional Chinese medicine, and or using a mixture of both. Um, but recently, an increasing number of people recognize that both medical systems have, have advantages and both should be used for their strong points. Um, here's a Amelia Matheson. My Chinese name is Maya. I forgot to put the slides here. Um, so my presentation is about video games in China. And so some statistics and background information are about a third of Chinese, uh, Chinese population are gamers, and that includes about 685 million people. Keep in mind that China's population as of 2023 is about 1.45 billion. So revenue from the video game industry as of 2021 was 46 billion US dollars. And between 2020 and 2021, uh, revenue growth slowed and the number of gamers also decreased probably by uh, due to effects of the pandemic. However, the industry as a whole is expected to grow about 14% compound annually. So that means like it grows 14% of last year's and then this year, next year, it's going to be 40% of this year's number. So that's what compound is. If you're familiar with compound interest, it's the same, um, same like strategy. <clears throat> and then also, mobile gamers are uh, games are most popular, and the most popular genres being role playing games, uh, multiplayer online battle arena games, which will probably come up later in like esports, and then also shooting games. We took that one there. <laughs> um, so the first ban that took place uh, back in the 1990s. And that was when gaming was becoming increasingly more popular, but consoles were expensive. So whereas in the Western world, consoles were readily available, say in America and, and in Europe, however, consoles in China were expensive because there were some like um, trade disagreements. Is what I um, however, later with increased international trade, uh, consoles got cheaper. Then the Ministry of Culture issued a ban, a ban on video games and they started them to be harmful to uh, young people and they also threatened state security and disturbed social order. Again, this goes back to um, the trade disagreements and they thought maybe the games are having a negative impact on state security. The ban, however, was not very, um, not very effective because a lot of people were just like, well, you didn't ban computer gaming though. So um, because of this, uh, internet cafes became very popular. They started to boom and expand, and you can have many internet cafes on a single block in uh, many Chinese cities. So the ban was then lifted in 2015 because it was ineffective. Uh, today, about 90% of Gen Zers in China play games. About 18% of those players play over 30 hours a week. So the average work week in America is 40 hours, full-time job. So you can say that these kids' full-time job is playing games. And so then they're <laughs> back in 2021, um, August 2021, the government then issued a second ban. And, and they said this is because uh, gaming is an addiction for these young kids and it negatively impacts their mental and physical health. So with these new restrictions, um, for minors, 
Um, there's no gaming between the hours of 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. And they're only allowed 90 minutes of game time during the weekdays, which is a lot of time considering I know uh, uh, schooling in China is pretty rigorous. So I guess 90 minutes is a good chunk of time compared to all the time they spent in school. And then over the weekends and holidays, they're allowed three hours. So when I did the math, I think I was about 13.5 total hours of game time during the week, which is a drastic decrease compared to 30 hours. Um, as for esports, I'm not sure if, like, how many of you are, are familiar with Tencent, but it's a huge, 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 huge like company in China, and they um, own Riot Games, which is an American gaming company. Now, Riot Games is responsible for developing League of Legends as well as organizing massive esport tournaments um, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, most notably, Shanghai frequently hosts uh, a number of tournaments, including. Uh, many League of Legends championships, um, and I think maybe they have one recently as well. And so this screen grab I got is from a uh, Chinese uh, drama on Netflix that's in my list. I haven't started it yet, but I will. Um, and it's supposed to be about this esports team um, in China, and it's called. <laughs> I'll get the name to you. I promise. I, no, King's Avatar. That's what it was. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Uh, so I did my presentation on WeChat. My English name is uh, Wesley Barkley, and my Chinese name is uh, Bei Wenzhi. Uh, so WeChat has grown over the years. It's transformed into uh, a quote unquote super chat for all the cups in chat app where it takes up multiple apps all in, all in one. Uh, it's essential to living in China. Uh, that does everything from paying for food through QR codes to posting on social media. Uh, and the give reference within China, there's, they, you, they don't use credit or debit cards uh, and ATMs are, are, are you, you can't really find them a lot, a lot. and so either the two forms of, of uh, paying for something are either WeChat or um, just cash. Um, it rolls four big uh, forms of apps into one, so it has social media, communication, spending money, and then smaller apps w baked in within the app. So it has like McDonald's or uh, uh, all sorts of like little apps that you can go through within the app. Approximately 40% of company sales go through China through WeChat, That's which crazy. is a lot. Um, it like has a very large fold of the marketplace. Um, and uh, yeah, oh, also like everything uh, within China, uh, China, the government monitors WeChat. So if you're just, if you're using WeChat, uh, it is monitored by them too. Yeah. Hi, my name is Anya and my Chinese name is Leanne. I did my presentation on Dianpeng, which is kind of a Chinese version of American Yelp. And it literally, Dianpeng literally translates to public reviews, and it contains reviews on everything from restaurants to food trends to hotels, babysitters, and more. And not only does it have reviews on specific places, it has like articles like top 10 best hotels in this area, top 10 best restaurants in this area, so it's great for travelers to find out what's popular in China among the locals. And it has a total of 628.4 million users. And this is an example of an article on Tianping. It's the top 10 best cities in China for foodies. Number one is Nanjing, number two is Beijing, number three is Shenzhen, number four is Guangzhou, number five is Jiamen, number six is Shaoxing, number seven is Hangzhou, number eight is Shanghai, number nine is Suzhou, number 10 is Shenyang.
Hi everybody, my name is Chris, and my, my Chinese name is B. Can you please say your name again? Huh? Please say your name again. My English or Chinese? Yes, your English name. Oh, my English name is Peter. Peter, thank you. Sorry. All right. Now, here, this is a kind of a iteration of uh, talking about shopping. I presented two, I'm presenting on two websites. One is Alibaba, which I'm saying now. The other one is uh, AliExpress. Um, Alibaba is China's biggest online e-commerce company and is a B2B marketplace. B2B is a business to business marketplace. So it's a, it's a company that um, is able to like sell and Oh, it's a company that sells products and then um, that sells products and other businesses. Um, and kind of, it's uh, kind of similar to uh, Taobao, like uh, Chad mentioned. Although um, it's like a retail model. Um, Alibaba was founded by founded by Jack Ma in. Uh, technically in 1998, uh, he was born in 1964. Um, Jack Ma was a former English teacher and uh, and it, it, that was his initial goal. Um, and his uh, demand for learning English was uh, taken off from uh, many Capitalistic minded Chinese kids in this. Um, oh, the other thing is, um, the other one is to that he, he worked at the, he, after he was an English teacher, he then uh, switched it to a career business. Um, And the uh, and the goal for starting Alibaba is to leverage the power of a wholesale Chinese marketplace. Now, now Alibaba Group was laid out in a small part in Hangzhou, China. It's it's kind of similar to um, Steve Jobs and Steve and Steve Wozniak in when launching Apple. Apple's one of those. Um, uh, electronic brands. Um, all right, he focused on the website regarding China commerce, um, and then he created China Pages. Now, China Pages is is a Chinese company that um, that created websites for Chinese businesses, and also one of the one of the first one of the first China's internet companies. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the other one is called AliExpress. Now, AliExpress is owned by the Ali Baba Group, which is on as launched in 2010. Now, it's kind of similar to some of the products that you might see in Amazon and eBay. Um, the only difference meaning, the only difference is that most of the products that you see are, that you'll see are cheaper. Um, now this is because, that's because most of these products are, are based in China and they are sourced direct, directly from uh, China manufacturers. Um, now some of these, now most of the products that you see are just um, but one thing, one thing you gotta pay attention to is some of these products um, might be uh, uh, poor quality, especially with uh, the try. So, so if you do shop there, uh, be aware of uh, products that are in use condition. Some of some of them are poor. Now, one of the examples is like electronics with 
especially with the replacement screen. Like I did recently saw one of uh, one of one of you two's name, Hugh Jeffries. Hugh Jeffries is a right to repair advocate, and uh, he uh, in a couple of these videos um, he saw uh, he fixed a couple of. Uh, Burns. One of which is the uh, ceramic burn, which had a flat screen, um, and the other one was the uh, Samsung Galaxy Note 7, which was which had been recalled. Now, <coughs> he sourced these replacement parts from AliExpress, um, and he did tell us, and, and he did tell that um, some of these products might be poor, so he had to. Uh, by a, couple, um, by a couple of them, because one of which might be poor and the other might be in good condition. Um, now the Xiaomi phone, um, he, um, again, he, he only used AliExpress parts and, oh, and uh, again, he used uh, the cycle of AliExpress to uh, create a uh, to like uh, re restore the firm and though it was good as expected, you might see um, a problem with the screen, uh, particularly when you look at the side where the colors might be inverted. Um, and that's it. <coughs>